This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Winning of Lucinda by L. M. Montgomery. Read by Mindy. The marriage of a Penhollow was always the signal for a gathering of the Penhollows. From the uttermost parts of the earth they would come. Penhollows by birth, and Penhollows by marriage, and Penhollows by ancestry. East Grafton was the ancient habitat of the race, and Penhollow Grange, where old John Penhollow lived, was a mecca to them. As for the family itself, the exact kinship of all its various branches and ramifications was a hard thing to define. Old Uncle Julius Penhollow was looked upon as a veritable wonder, because he carried it all in his head, and could tell on sight just what relation any one Penhollow was to any other Penhollow. The rest made a blind guess at it, for the most part, and the younger Penhollows let it go at loose cousinship. In this instance it was Alice Penhollow, daughter of young John Penhollow, who was to be married. Alice was a nice girl, but she and her wedding will only pertain to this story in so far as they furnish a background for Lucinda. Hence, nothing more need be said of her. On the afternoon of her wedding day, the Penhollows held to the good old-fashioned custom of evening weddings, with a rousing dance afterwards. Penhollow Grange was filled to overflowing with guests who had come there to have tea and rest themselves before going down to young John's. Many of them had driven fifty miles. In the big autumnal orchard, the younger fry foregathered and chatted and coquetted. Upstairs, in old Mrs. John's bedroom, she and her married daughters held high conclave. Old John had established himself with his sons and sons-in-law in the parlor, and the three daughters-in-law were making themselves at home in the blue sitting-room, ear-deep in harmless family gossip. Lucinda and Romney Penhollow were also there. Thin Mrs. Nathaniel Penhollow, who sat in a rocking-chair and toasted her toes at the grate, for the brilliant autumn afternoon was slightly chilly, and Lucinda, as usual, had the window open. She and plump Mrs. Frederick Penhollow did most of the talking. Mrs. George Penhollow, being rather out of it by reason of her newness, she was George Penhollow's second wife, married only a year. Hence, her contributions to the conversation were rather spasmodic, hurled in, as it were, by dead reckoning, being sometimes appropriate and sometimes savoring of a point of view not strictly Penhollow-esque. Romney Penhollow was sitting in a corner, listening to the chatter of the woman, with the inscrutable smile that always vexed Mrs. Frederick. Mrs. George wondered within herself what he did there among the women. She also wondered just where he belonged on the family tree. He was not one of the uncles, yet he could not be much younger than George. Forty if he is a day,' was Mrs. George's mental dictum. "'but a very handsome and fascinating man. "'I never saw such a splendid chin and dimple.' "'Lucinda, with bronze-coloured hair and the whitest of skins, "'defiant of merciless sunlight and revelling in the crisp air, "'sat on the sill of the open window behind the crimson vine leaves, "'looking out into the garden, "'where Delia's flamed and asters broke into waves of purple and snow.' The ruddy light of the autumn afternoon gave a sheen to the waves of her hair, and brought out the exceeding purity of her Greek outlines. Mrs. George knew who Lucinda was, a cousin of the second generation, and, in spite of her thirty-five years, the acknowledged beauty of the whole Penhollow connection. She was one of those rare women who keep their loveliness unmarred by the passage of years. She had ripened and matured, but she had not grown old. The older Penhollows were still inclined, from sheer force of habit, to look upon her as a girl, and the younger Penhollows hailed her as one of themselves. Yet Lucinda never aped girlishness. Good taste and a strong sense of humor preserved her amid many temptations thereto. She was simply a beautiful, fully developed woman, with whom time had declared a truce. 
young, with a mellow youth which had nothing to do with years. Mrs. George liked and admired Lucinda. Now, when Mrs. George liked and admired any person, it was a matter of necessity with her to impart her opinions to the most convenient confidant. In this case, it was Romney Penhollow to whom Mrs. George remarked sweetly, "'Really, don't you think our Lucinda is looking remarkably well this fall?' It seemed a very harmless, inane, well-meant question, but poor Mrs. George might be well excused for feeling bewildered over the effect. Romney gathered his long legs together, stood up, and swept the unfortunate speaker a crushing penhollow bow of state. "'Far be it from me to disagree with the opinion of a lady, especially when it concerns another lady,' he said as he left the blue room. Overcome by the mordant satire in his tone, Mrs. George glanced speechlessly at Lucinda. Behold, Lucinda had squarely turned her back on the party, and was gazing out into the garden, with a very decided flush on the snowy curves of her neck and cheek. Then Mrs. George looked at her sisters-in-law. They were regarding her with the tolerant amusement they might bestow on a blundering child. Mrs. George experienced that subtle prescience whereby it is given us to know that we have put our foot in it. She felt herself turning an uncomfortable brick red. What penhollow skeleton had she unwittingly jangled? Why, oh why, was it such an evident breach of proprieties to praise Lucinda? Mrs. George was devoutly thankful that a summons to the tea-table rescued her from her mire of embarrassment. The meal was spoiled for her, however. The mortifying recollection of her mysterious blunder conspired with her curiosity to banish appetite. As soon as possible after tea, she decoyed Mrs. Frederick out into the garden, and in the Delilah walk solemnly demanded the reason for it. Mrs. Frederick indulged in a laugh which put the metal on her festal brown silk seams to the test. "'My dear Cecilia, it was so amusing,' she said a little patronizingly. "'But why?' cried Mrs. George, resenting the patronage and the mystery. "'What was so dreadful in what I said, or so funny? "'And who is this Romney Penhollow who mustn't be spoken to?' "'Oh, Romney's one of the Charlottetown Penhollows,' explained Mrs. Frederick. "'He is a lawyer there. "'He is a first cousin of Lucinda's, and a second of George's. "'Or is he? "'Oh, bother! "'You must go to Uncle James if you want the genealogy.' I'm in a chronic muddle concerning Penhollow relationship. As for Romney, of course you can speak to him about anything you like, except Lucinda. Oh, you innocent, to ask him if he didn't think Lucinda was looking well, and right before her, too. Of course he thought you did it on purpose to tease him, and that was what made him so savage and sarcastic. But why? persisted Mrs. George, sticking tenaciously to her point. "'Hasn't George told you?' "'No,' said George's wife in mild exasperation. "'George has spent most of his time since we were married "'telling me odd things about the Penhollows, "'but he hasn't got to that yet, evidently. "'Why, my dear, it is our family romance. "'Lucinda and Romney are in love with each other. "'They've been in love with each other for fifteen years, "'and in all that time they've never spoken to each other once. "'Dear me!' murmured Mrs. George, feeling the inadequacy of mere language. Was this a penhollow method of courtship? But why? They had a quarrel fifteen years ago, said Mrs. Frederick patiently. Nobody knows how it originated, or anything about it, except that Lucinda was in the wrong. We know that because Lucinda herself admitted it to us afterwards. But in the first flush of her rage, she told Romney that she would never speak to him again as long as she lived. "'and he said that he would never speak to her until she spoke first, "'because, you see, as she was in the wrong, she ought to make the first advance. "'And they never have spoken. "'Everybody in the connection, I suppose, has taken turns trying to reconcile them, "'but nobody has succeeded. "'I don't believe that Romney has ever so much as thought of any other woman in his whole life, "'and certainly Lucinda has never thought of any other man. "'You will notice she still wears Romney's ring.' They're practically engaged still, of course. And Romney said once that if Lucinda would just say one word, no matter what it was, even if it were something insulting, he would speak too and beg her pardon for his share in the quarrel, because then, you see, he would not be breaking his word. 
He hasn't referred to the matter for years, but I presume that he's of the same mind still. And they are just as much in love with each other as they ever were. He's always hanging about where she is, when other people are there too, that is. He avoids her like a plague when she is alone. That is why he stuck out in the blue room with us today. There doesn't seem to be a particle of resentment between them. If Lucinda would only speak. But that Lucinda will not do. Don't you think she will yet? said Mrs. George. Mrs. Frederick shook her crimped head sagely. Not now. The whole thing has hardened too long. Her pride will never let her speak. We used to hope she would be tricked into it by forgetfulness or accident. We used to lay traps for her, but all to no effect. It is such a shame, too. They were made for each other. Do you know, I get cross when I begin to thrash the whole silly affair over like this. Doesn't it sound as if we were talking of the quarrel of two school children? Of late years we have learned that it does not do to speak of Lucinda to Romney, even in the most commonplace way. He seems to resent it. He ought to speak, cried Mrs. George warmly. Even if she were in the wrong ten times over, he ought to overlook it and speak first. But he won't, and she won't. You never saw two such determined mortals. They get it from their grandfather on the mother's side, old Absalom, Absalom Gordon. There is no such stubbornness on the Penhollow side. His obstinacy was a proverb, my dear, actually a proverb. Whatever he said, he would stick to if the skies fell. He was a terrible old man to swear to, added Mrs. Frederick, dropping into irrelevant reminiscence. He spent a long time in a mining camp in his younger days, and he never got over it. The habit of swearing, I mean. It would have made your blood run cold, my dear, to have heard him go on at times. And yet he was a real good old man in every other way. He couldn't help it somehow. He tried to, but he used to say that profanity came as natural to him as breathing. It used to mortify his family terribly. Fortunately, none of them took after him in that respect. But he's dead, and one shouldn't speak ill of the dead. I must go and get Maddie Penhallow to do my hair. I would burst these sleeves clean out if I tried to do it myself, and I don't want to dress over again. You won't be likely to talk to Romney about Lucinda again, my dear Cecilia. Fifteen years, murmured Mrs. George helplessly to the Dahlias. Engaged for fifteen years and never speaking to each other. Dear heart and soul, think of it. Oh, these penhollows. Meanwhile, Lucinda, serenely unconscious that her love story was being mouthed over by Mrs. Frederick in the Dahlia Garden, was dressing for the wedding. Lucinda still enjoyed dressing for a festivity, since the mirror still dealt gently with her. Moreover, she had a new dress. Now, a new dress, and especially one as nice as this, was a rarity with Lucinda, who belonged to a branch of the Penhollows noted for being chronically hard up. Indeed, Lucinda and her widowed mother were positively poor, and hence an uncle had given her this one, a beautiful, perishable thing, such as Lucinda never would have dared to choose for herself, but in which she reveled with feminine delight. It was of pale green voile, a color which brought out admirably the ruddy gloss of her hair and the clear brilliance of her skin. When she had finished dressing, she looked at herself in the mirror with frank delight. Lucinda was not vain, but she was quite well aware of the fact of her beauty, and took an impersonal pleasure in it, as if she were looking at some finely painted picture by a master hand. The form and face reflected in the glass satisfied her. The puffs and draperies of the green voile displayed to perfection the full but not over-full curves of her fine figure. Lucinda lifted her arm and touched a red rose to her lips with the hand upon which shone the frosty glitter of Romney's diamond. Looking at the graceful slope of her shoulder and the splendid line of chin and throat with critical approval, she noted, too, how well the gown became her eyes, bringing out all the deeper color in them. Lucinda had magnificent eyes. Once Romney had written a sonnet to them in which he compared their color to ripe blueberries. This may not sound poetical to you, unless you know or remember just what the tints of ripe blueberries are. 
dusky purple in some lights, clear slate in others, and yet again in others the misty hue of early meadow violets. You really look very well, remarked the real Lucinda to the mirrored Lucinda. Nobody would think you were an old maid, but you are. Alice Penhollow, who is to be married tonight, was a child of five when you thought of being married fifteen years ago. That makes you an old maid, my dear. Well, it is your own fault, and it will continue to be your own fault, you stubborn offshoot of a stubborn breed. She flung her train out straight and pulled on her gloves. I do hope I won't get any spots on this dress tonight, she reflected. It will have to do me for a gala dress for a year at least, and I have a creepy conviction that it is fearfully spottable. Bless Uncle Mark's good, uncalculating heart. How I would have detested it if he had given me something sensible and useful and ugly, as Aunt Amelia would have done. They all went to young John Penhollow's at early moonrise. Lucinda drove over the two miles of hill and dale with a youthful second cousin by name Carrie Penhollow. The wedding was quite a brilliant affair. Lucinda seemed to pervade the social atmosphere, and everywhere she went a little ripple of admiration trailed after her like a wave. She was undeniably a belle. Yet she found herself feeling faintly bored, and was rather glad than otherwise when the guests began to fray off. "'I'm afraid I'm losing my capacity for enjoyment,' she thought a little drearily. "'Yes, I must be growing old.' That is what it means when social functions begin to bore you. It was that unlucky Mrs. George who blundered again. She was standing on the veranda when Carrie Penhollow dashed up. Tell Lucinda that I can't take her back to the Grange. I have to drive Mark and Sissy Penhollow to Bright River to catch the two o'clock express. There will be plenty of chances for her with the others. At this moment, George Penhollow, holding his rearing horse with difficulty, shouted for his wife. Mrs. George, all in a flurry, dashed back into the still-crowded hall. Exactly to whom she gave her message was never known to any of the Penhollows, but a tall, ruddy-haired girl, dressed in pale green organdy, and Shirley from Avonlea, told Marilla Cuthbert and Rachel Lynde as a joke the next morning how a chubby little woman in a bright pink fascinator had clutched her by the arm and gasped out, "'Carrie Penhollow can't take you. He says you're to look out for someone else.' and was gone before she could answer or turn around. Thus it was that Lucinda, when she came out to the veranda step, found herself unaccountably deserted. All the Grange Penhollows were gone. Lucinda realized this after a few moments of bewildered seeking, and she understood that if she were to get to the Grange that night, she must walk. Plainly, there was nobody to take her. Lucinda was angry. It is not pleasant to find yourself forgotten and neglected. It is still less pleasant to walk home alone, along a country road at one o'clock in the morning, way wearing a pale green voile. Lucinda was not prepared for such a walk. She had nothing on her feet save thin-soled shoes, and her only wraps were a flimsy fascinator and short coat. "'What a guy I shall look stalking home alone in this rig,' she thought crossly. There was no help for it unless she confessed her plight to some of the stranger guests and begged to ride home. Lucinda's pride scorned such a request, and the admission of neglect it involved. No, she would walk, since that was all there was to it. But she would not go by the main road to be stared at by all and sun-dry who might pass her. There was a shortcut by way of a lane across the fields. She knew every inch of it, although she had not traversed it for years. She gathered up the green voile as trimly as possible, slipped around the house and in the kindly shadows, picked her way across the side lawn, and found a gate which opened into a birch-bordered lane where the frosted trees shone with silvery golden radiance in the moonlight. Lucinda flitted down the lane, growing angrier at every step as the realization of how shamefully she seemed to have been treated came home to her. She believed that nobody had thought about her at all, which was tenfold worse than premeditated neglect. As she came to the gate at the lower end of the lane, a man who was leaning over it started with a quick intake of his breath, which, in any other man than Romney Penhollow, or for any other woman than Lucinda Penhollow, would have been an exclamation of surprise. 
Lucinda recognized him with a great deal of annoyance and a little relief. She would not have to walk home alone. But with Romney Penhollow? Would he think she had contrived it so purposefully? Romney silently opened the gate for her, silently latched it behind her, and silently fell into step beside her. Down across a velvety sweep of field they went. The air was frosty, calm, and still. Over the world lay a haze of moonshine and mist that converted East Grafton's prosaic hills and fields into a shimmering fairyland. At first, Lucinda felt angrier than ever. What a ridiculous situation! How the Penhollows would laugh over it! As for Romney, he too was angry with the trick impish chance had played him. He liked being the butt of an awkward situation as little as most men, and certainly to be obliged to walk home over moonlit fields at one o'clock in the morning with the woman he had loved and never spoken to for fifteen years was the irony of fate with a vengeance. Would she think he had schemed for it? And how the deuce did she come to be walking home from the wedding at all? By the time they had crossed the field and reached the wild cherry lane beyond it, Lucinda's anger was mastered by her saving sense of humor. She was even smiling a little maliciously under her fascinator. The lane was a place of enchantment, a long moonlit colonnade adown which beguiling wood nymphs might have footed it featly. The moonshine fell through the arcing boughs and made a mosaic of silver light and clear-cut shadow for the unfriendly lovers to walk in. On either side was the hovering gloom of the woods, and around them a great silence, unstirred by wind or murmur. Midway in the lane, Lucinda was attacked by a sentimental recollection. She thought of the last time Romney and she had walked home together through this very lane from a party at Young John's. It had been moonlight then, too, and Lucinda checked a sigh. They had walked hand in hand. Just here, by the big gray beach, he had stopped her and kissed her. Lucinda wondered if he were thinking of it, too, and stole a look at him from under the lace border of her fascinator. But he was striding moodily along with his hands in his pockets, and his hat pulled down over his eyes, passing the old beach without a glance at it. Lucinda checked another sigh, gathered up in a scarped flutter of voile, and marched on. Past the lane, a range of three silvery harvest fields sloped down to Peter Penhollow's brook, a wide, shallow stream bridged over in the olden days by the mossy trunk of an ancient fallen tree. When Lucinda and Romney arrived at the brook, they gazed at the brawling water, blankly. Lucinda remembered that she must not speak to Romney just in time to prevent an exclamation of dismay. There was no tree. There was no bridge of any kind over the brook. Here was a predicament. But before Lucinda could do more than despairingly ask herself what was to be done, now Romney answered, not in words, but in deeds. He coolly picked Lucinda up in his arms, as if she'd been a child instead of a full-grown woman of no mean avoir du poids, and began to wade with her through the water. Lucinda gasped helplessly. She could not forbid him, and she was so choked with rage over his presumption that she could not have spoken in any case. Then came the catastrophe. Romney's foot slipped on a treacherous round stone, there was a tremendous splash, and Romney and Lucinda Penhollow were sitting down in the middle of Peter Penhollow's brook. Lucinda was the first to regain her feet. About her clung, in heart-breaking limpness, the ruined voile. The remembrance of all her wrongs that night rushed over her soul, and her eyes blazed in the moonlight. Lucinda Penhollow had never been so angry in her life. "'You damned idiot!' she said, in a voice that literally shook with rage. Romney meekly scrambled up the bank after her. "'I'm awful sorry, Lucinda,' he said, striving with uncertain success to keep a suspicious quiver of laughter out of his tone. "'It, it was wretchedly clumsy of me, but that pebble turned right under my foot. Please forgive me for that and for other things.' Lucinda deigned no answer. She stood on a flat stone and wrung the water from the poor green voile. Romney surveyed her apprehensively. "'Hurry, Lucinda,' he entreated. "'You will catch your death of cold.' 
I never take cold, answered Lucinda with chattering teeth. And it is my dress I am thinking of, was thinking of. You have more need to hurry. You are sopping wet yourself, and you know you are subject to colds. There, come. Lucinda picked up the stringy train, which had been so brave and buoyant five minutes before, and started up the field at a brisk rate. Romney came up to her and slipped his arm through hers in the old way. For a time, they walked along in silence. Then Lucinda began to shake with inward laughter. She laughed silently for the whole length of the field, and at the line fence between Peter Penhallow's land and the Grange Acres, she paused, threw back the fascinator from her face, and looked at Romney defiantly. "'You are thinking of that,' she cried. "'And I am thinking of it, and we will go on thinking of it at intervals for the rest of our lives. But if you ever mention it to me, I'll never forgive you, Romney Penhallow.' "'I never will,' promised Romney." There was more than a suspicion of laughter in his voice this time, but Lucinda did not choose to resent it. She did not speak again until they reached the Grange Gate. Then she faced him solemnly. "'It was a case of atavism,' she said. Old Grandfather Gordon was to blame for it. At the Grange, almost everybody was in bed. What with the guests straggling home at intervals and hurrying sleepily off to their rooms, nobody had missed Lucinda, each set supposing she was with some other set.' Mrs. Frederick, Mrs. Nathaniel, and Mrs. George alone were up. The perennially chilly Mrs. Nathaniel had kindled a fire of chips in the blue room grate to warm her feet before retiring, and the three women were discussing the wedding in subdued tones when the door opened and the stately form of Lucinda, stately even in the draggled voile, appeared, and with a damp Romney behind her. "'Lucinda Penhollow!' gasped they, one and all. "'I was left to walk home.' said Lucinda coolly. So Romney and I came across the fields. There was no bridge over the brook, and when he was carrying me over, he slipped and we fell in. That is all. No, Cecilia, I never take cold, so don't worry. Yes, my dress is ruined, but that is of no consequence. No, thank you, Cecilia. I do not care for a hot drink. Romney, do go and take off those wet clothes of yours immediately. No, Cecilia, I will not take a hot foot bath. I am going straight to bed. Good night." When the door closed on the pair, the three sisters-in-law stared at each other, Mrs. Frederick, feeling herself incapable of expressing her sensations originally, took refuge in a quote. "'Do I sleep? Do I dream? Do I wonder and doubt? Is things what they seem, or is visions about?' "'There will be another Penhollow wedding soon,' said Mrs. Nathaniel with a long breath. "'Lucinda has spoken to Romney.' at last. Oh, what do you suppose she said to him? cried Mrs. George. My dear Cecilia, said Mrs. Frederick, we shall never know. They never did know. End of The Winning of Lucinda by Ellen Montgomery